it's here or almost. On the 25th of November, we will see uh, the Threadripper third generation processor being released onto the market and with it an avalanche of TRX40 powered supporting motherboard which of course I'll try to review all uh, in the shortest possible amount of time. But I'm always very excited about Threadripper uh, release because even though it's really aimed to cater to the smallest portion of, of the computer market, it's also the most exciting showcase of, of the craziness AMD can do. I mean, you're talking about unprecedented amount of high core counts and every generation sees a double of it. We started with 16 cores with a Threadripper 1, 32 cores for Threadripper 2, and now 64 cores, 128 threads with the third generation of Threadripper. And to really harness all the potential of that processor, you need the right kind of motherboard. And of course, I wanted to start with the one you're most likely going to see in your favorite uh, uh, computer store and uh, somewhat of a gold standard on the market. And so today I am previewing the Prime TRX 40 Pro. And in all fairness, if you've never seen what an excited Frenchman looks and smells like, you're welcome. So TRX40 powered motherboard are the first motherboards coming in a PCIe 4.0 standard, no matter what. I mean, it's still compatible with the PCIe third generation, but no matter what processor you're gonna be putting on this motherboard, you will be able to operate a PCIe 4.0 enabled component, unlike the X570 powered motherboard. It also means many, many more PCIe lanes. Threadripper 3 combined with TRX40 will give you about 88 PCIe lanes at 4.0 PCIe 4.0 standard, meaning about more or less, if I remember well, 170 gigabytes of bandwidth. This is unprecedented and, and potentially a, a, a game changer in, in the workstation world. But on the flip side, it's not backward compatible. So if you do want to upgrade to a third generation Threadripper, it's gonna cost you quite a lot. Now, starting with the obvious, we are dealing with a surprisingly compact ATX six layered PCB. And six layer is just the right amount to properly isolate PCIe 4.0 uh, trace signaling to avoid any kind of interferences with other components. And on top of it, it's also very good for VRM heat dissipation. So we are starting on a good start. It is powered by the TRX4 CPU socket, which despite having the same number of pins than its predecessors, the TR4 can only support third generation Threadripper processor. And as I said, it's something we all feared, especially knowing that those motherboards do not come cheap. VRM wise, well, a lot has changed. Third generation Threadripper CPUs will come with up to 64 cores and 128 threads. And obviously to even hope power that many cores, well, manufacturers had to deploy an unprecedented amount of Power! We are dealing with 1960 amps power stages, 16 of which are dedicated to the CPU power delivery. That means 960 amps, almost an obscene kilo amps to run and overclock your uh, third generation of Threadripper. And of course that is more power, much more power than you'll need even for 60 core count processor. So even though they have not yet hit the market, it almost hint at next year release uh, and, and makes us dream about a 128 core count, but I'm digressing. Now, obviously with that much power comes great heat signatures and that is precisely why Asus has designed that massive, and I mean massive, space looking five centimeter tall heatsink. But do not be fooled, even though uh, it will be enough and more than enough to keep your VRM cool when running and even overclocking a 32 core count processor, I have some doubts about its ability to keep our VRM from thermal throttling when uh, uh, overclocking a 64 core count. But in all fairness, 
With this kind of workstation, uh, motherboards and processors, this is when custom water cooling comes in and monoblock should be considered. Memory-wise, well, this is another first. We have a quad-channel configuration supporting up to 256 gigabyte of DDR4 RAM, overclockable up to 4.4 gigahertz. I mean, this is insane, but not surprising given uh, how many memory you will need to have to keep running, to feeding uh, 128 threads, but it also means a lot of money. I mean, you're looking about $1,200 to $1,500 just worth of RAM to get this fully populated to max specs. So, so definitely something you'd have to keep in mind. Staying in the memory, our Prime TRX 40 Pro supports up to three M.2 solid state drive sticks, two horizontal and one vertical. With PCIe third generation M.2 solid state drive sticks, you can hope to achieve speeds up to 32 gigabit per second. And with PCIe 4.0 enabled M.2 solid state drive sticks, you can double that and see massive transfer rate peaking at 64 gigabit per second. In both cases, this will produce quite a bit of heat, and that is precisely why Asus has come up with a massive monoplate thermo padded heat shield to keep our horizontal sticks cool as it can be. Now, I do have some concern about their placements. One, because they are right next to each other. Second, because they are trapped right under uh, what could be and usually is a multiple GPU configuration, at least with Threadripper configuration. So um, if you are planning to boot from an M.2 solid state drive, I would place it on the vertical mount away from those infernal heat producing GPUs. Now let's take a quick look at our TRX40 chipset. Without going into many details, and just as we have seen in the X570 powered motherboard, we have a power hungry chipset. It's really difficult as of today to know exactly how much power this chipset will, will need, but I do risk myself or predicting that it's going to be producing anywhere between 15 and 18 watts of heat signature. And that absolutely explains why manufacturers have decided to go with active cooling solutions. In our case, a 60,000 hours graded ball bearing Delta turbine. Worth noting, our VRM SOC phases are placed right next to our TRX40 chipset and have their own dedicated radial heat sink right here. I do suspect that uh, the reason why Asus has done this is purely budget driven. If they had placed those three uh, power stages, uh, as we find them usually under the IO roofing, then uh, Asus would have had to create a two block uh, uh, VRM heatsink and usually connected by a heat pipe, which cost quite more at manufacturing. So placing it right under uh, our active cooling solutions, which probably provides more air than needed to just keep our chipset cool, makes sense in a budget-driven way, which is good for your wallet and mine. But hey, that's just me rambling and speculating. I'm so lonely. Export-wise, we have four PCIe slots, which can all run up to four generation PCIe, one four slot for speed, and three metallically reinforced 16 slots all of which can run up to full 16 bus speed at PCIe 4th generation. Do you even know what that means? If you look at your current computer, chances are you are running on a PCIe 3rd generation, which produces up to 16 gigabyte per second at full speed on a 16 slot. Going to PCIe 4th generation, double that available bandwidth to 32 gigabyte per second per PCIe 16 slot, 16 speed. So we're dealing with 32 plus 32 plus 32. That's, that's 96 gigabyte per second on a single motherboard. That sounds amazing, doesn't it? It does, it is, it is great, don't get me wrong. But because we don't have yet video cards which can take full advantage of those kind of bandwidth level, then you're stuck at PCIe third generation uh, uh, standard level because right now, none of our 2080 Ti or Titan or what have you are going or are spewing more than 16 gigabyte per second of bandwidth. So great for future proofing, but as as workstation go, as, as rendering, as 3D rendering or video editing goes, you won't feel a difference, sadly at least for now, until next year and until next generation GPUs hit the market. Back IO-wise, first let me know the presence of an integrated back IO plate 
always a good thing. And starting from the left, we have six five gigabit per second USB plugs, only four USB 3.2, 10 gigabit, including a Type-C. And I say only four because the TRX40 chipset can support up to 20 3.2 second generation 10 gigabit plugs. That was quick. And we only have four here, plus the one on the front panel that we'll see later. And I find this a little bit lazy, especially for Pro Series. We also have a flashback button, a gigabit LAN, and a rather premium 8-channel 1220S Realtek codec. And as you probably noticed, there is no Wi-Fi adapter on this motherboard, which again is, is a little bit uh, disappointing for Pro Series. But there is an onboard Wi-Fi expansion slot for some easy and inexpensive Wi-Fi Wi-Fi slash Bluetooth upgrade. And in my opinion, that was a lazy and a cheap move coming from Asus. Front panel connector wise, we have two second generation USB connectors, two five gigabit USB connector, and a fifth 10 gigabit type C front panel connector. Nothing extravagant. As cooling support, we do have seven PWM fan connectors, two of which can support water pumps and a single external thermal sensor connector. So everything you will need to run um, any kind of cooling solutions, including complex dual loop custom water cooling solutions, which, you know, when you come when it comes to Threadripper builds is not so unlikely and not only in the realm of enthusiastic people because Threadrippers are notoriously hot. But I will regret the fact that these front panel fan connectors are not hybrid connectors as I had been accustomed to see coming from, well, another manufacturer's hours gigabyte uh, on their X570 powered motherboard, which if you don't know about, you should be checking on my channel as well. And what hybrid connectors do, as the name Intel, is a multiple compatibility function. You can put fans, you can put water pumps, you can put flow, water flow sensor, it doesn't matter. If you have a connector, it can support anything you're gonna connect on it perfectly without any issue. And that is the kind, that kind of straightforwardness that I really would like to see bleeding out to all the manufacturers out there. Troubleshooting wise, we have most importantly a QLED screen, which is absolutely crucial to debug failed boot. And believe it or not, on Threadripper uh, builds, it's more common than on other builds. Given the complexity and the amount of bandwidth, it doesn't surprise me one bit. But on top of it, we also have an easy debugger, which uh, will help us refine our troubleshooting process. This is a combo that I do expect to see on every TRX40 powered motherboard. We have a soldered start button, no reset, no memory, just a start button, which I find again a little short and cheap coming from Asus, especially given the grotesque amount of memory this board can support a memo key button would have been uh, welcome. And finally, this would not be an Asus motherboard without an invasion of RGB or a sync effect connectors and strips all around, which of course will make your computer run faster. Starting with one addressable RGB strip hidden under the IO housing, two Aura RGB connectors here and two Aura addressable connectors. I love the fact that they've been placed in opposite pair at the opposite of the board to, uh, for, for an easier RGB connection accessibility. Obviously, if you did not find uh, building a Threadripper expensive enough, Asus have you covered. Now, in conclusion, the Prime TRX 40 Pro will run you about $500 before taxes. And um, because there was no Pro Series, on the X399 powered motherboard, the predecessor of the TRX40, it's hard to make a price comparison, but that's about $100 more than the Prime X399A, which I had also reviewed a couple years ago. Um, and the whole question is, is it worth it? Well, if you just look at the technology of the motherboard and, and, and what it does, yes, the Prime TRX40 Pro is the right kind of motherboard to juice out all the potential of a Threadripper processor, save the VRM overheating at 64 cores, which I predict, uh, it is the right kind of motherboard at this price range. But there are some regrets, as I mentioned. I don't think there is enough uh, uh, 3.2 10 gigabit plugs. I think that this, not having a Wi-Fi built-in adapter was a bit lazy. 
But other than that, we're dealing with a six layer, very well engineered Threadripper motherboard. And, but I don't want to go that, that quick on the conclusion because I have a couple of remarks which have nothing to do with the Threadripper, uh, with, a, with the Asus motherboard, but more about the technology. The question is, do you need to upgrade or do you need this? Well, if you're a gamer, absolutely not. In general, since the second generation of Threadripper, do not waste your time in Threadripper builds because having such a high core count actually will negatively impact your gaming in gaming performances. You'll have to use Ryzen Master to deactivate some core count so to increase your gaming performances. So pass your way, no needed. Now for workstations um, like video rendering and video editors out there, because we cannot yet uh, or because we do not yet have the components, the PCIe 4.0 compatible components, which can take full advantage of the PCIe 4 abilities of this motherboard, I would wait. I would wait another six months uh, to see what kind of video cards are going to hit the market and, and what kind of bandwidth level they can, they can output. Because so far, your video cards are fine with PCIe 3. And as the processor goes, we don't have yet the 64 core count on the market. It's not been announced yet. We don't know exactly the specs. We only have uh, 16 and 32 core count. So um, great motherboard, but technology wise, my advice to you, if you're already running a Threadripper system of any sort, is just to wait it out. If you are not, and if you are looking for some serious, serious future proofing, and of course, enjoying the latest tech, then the prime, uh, TRX 40 Pro is definitely where your money wants to be.